has already been resurrected from the dead. The news was spreading like wildfire and people are converting left and right. There's 460 synagogues in Jerusalem at this time. 460, some built by the Jews, some built by others, uh, nations and countries, so that when they come there and worship, they can worship. And, and in front of this one particular synagogue, built from the people of Tarsus, is a young man named Saul. And in front of this synagogue, the same group of people, the same council that persecuted and killed Jesus Christ were now standing together again in front of a young man that has been drugged in front of them that they could not catch in a wrong. His name was Stephen. They looked for something that he did so that they could bring him up on some charges so that they could keep this guy quiet from spreading the gospel. They couldn't find anything, so they had to hire guys. They had to buy some guys to be able to go and be false witnesses. And so these guys they paid brought Stephen in front of the same council that killed Jesus Christ. Stephen shows up and we look in Acts, the seventh chapter. And we see the sermon that he gives these guys. Now this guy who's been talking about this Jesus Christ, he, he steps up to the plate. And certainly he's heard the threats. Certainly he should know that in this particular town to spread or talk about the word, the name of Jesus Christ was going to bring a lot of conflict. But he does anyway. He does what he's commanded to do. He does what Christ has commanded us to do in the Great Commission. He knows that what he is called to do and what he is supposed to do as a Christian is, is a calling that all of us have. These false accusers bring Stephen up and they, they bring him in front of the same council that has persecuted Christ and they... And they say, what do you got to say for yourself? Look at chapter 7 and verse 1. It says the high priest, the same high priest that had persecuted Christ, said, are these things so? He knows better. He's the same guy who screamed, give us Barabbas. That would send Jesus Christ to his death, knowing that Jesus Christ was innocent. Pontius Pilate would be there and know with all the evidence that there was nothing to convict Jesus Christ with and he said, I'm washing my hands of this thing. The same guy who called for his death is now standing in front of Stephen, this guy who would stand up for his faith. Stephen and Philip in the scripture were known as the two best preachers in the gospel. They had a way to be able to convey truth to the masses. Stephen's a lean guy. He's in shape. But he has this humility about himself. He has this look in his eyes that does not let you go to sleep without wondering what does he know that makes him different? You ever read somebody like that? You ever see somebody that went through something tough and then they handled it way different than you would have handled it? And you're wondering, what makes that guy tick? I mean, they were thinking as they looked at the Stephen guy, as he's standing there in front of this deadly group of Sanhedrin, does he really believe what he's saying about this Jesus Christ? It sounds like the guy really believes this. He really believes this, Jesus Christ. I mean, I've heard the stories they probably said. And well, actually, I, I, I've seen the results. They're seeing their neighbors convert in the 460 synagogues. People are leaving in droves. They're not showing up to listen anymore. They're, they're showing up and saying, hey, let's go listen to this Jesus Christ guy. It culminates in his crucifixion, and now the word has spread. These people have sought all of Jerusalem is converting. And the guys who were in those synagogues are ticked off. The same guy is there and he's paid guys to go get the 
Stephen and trump up charges on him. We're going to put an end to this madness. We're going to put an end to, to our coffers being empty. We're going to put an end to this so that we can continue doing business as usual. We've done it for thousands of years, the Sanhedrin said. You're telling me you're right? He looks at him and says, <coughs> Are these things so? And then Stephen opens his mouth. Verse 2. He said, Hear me, brethren and fathers. He knows their history as well as they do. And chapter 7, all the way through verse 53, is a sermon of the history of Judaism. And this guy knows it like the back of his hand. He's telling them, let, 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 let me tell you what I know. And he starts telling them the history of the Jews. And he's, he says to them, he, 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 he begins... Brethren and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, <clears throat> before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, leave your country and your relatives and come to the land and I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and he goes on, I want you to catch something right here. I'm not going to read the whole sermon to you. I want you to catch that Stephen knew the details of their faith. He knew the times. He knew the actions. He knew the details, and he takes them through their history. And he brings them all the way to this point as he conveys their history. He recites it verbatim, ending in a stinging rebuke of the murder of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 51 and 53. He goes through this whole thing and he tells them the history of the Jews. And the Jews are kind of sitting there saying, exactly. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's us. We have a rich history. That is us. And they're, they're standing there proud for this guy as he preaches in front of a crowd. end of this history lesson. Quoting the Old Testament from Isaiah, from Amos, from Exodus, from Genesis. He quotes all the way through their history. They're not in their heads. And then he says in verse 51, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in the heart and ears and are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute. They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Now when they heard this, it says in verse 54, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, now catch this. Right here in this part of history, right here in this part of history, when he is drugged in front of the Sanhedrin and he's being persecuted, they had a plan to shut him up. Watch this, church. Their plan was they were going to stone him. Yeah. Now, our idea of stoning somebody, or breaking the law in that first century, was that if they blasphemed God, then you had the right to take a person and drag them in front and throw a rock at the person, watch this, until they were dead. And 
What occurred, if I'm going to wait for these boys to bring this box out here? <laughs> this is a tough help. Just trying to get her out of here. <laughs> Thanks, fellas. <laughs> What they did was they perceived, we perceived stoning to be something along the lines of picking up a little rock and doing this. But the reality of what a stoning was, as we look in the history, sorry about that. Of Flavius Josephus, a historian, a Jewish historian. As you read his account of what a stony was, it says they would find a rock roughly the size of their hand. Then they would make the person kneel. In the account that we see here, if you look in verse 54, it says they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth to crown was angry because their history had been laid out for him. And he said, you have killed the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It says, being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and he saw the glory of God. And watch this. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I want you to put an asterisk next to verse 55 in your Bible. Because this is the only time in Scripture that you're going to see Jesus Standing at the right hand of God the Father. In all the other instances, he sits at the right hand of God the Father. What does that mean? 2012, right where we are. It says this, that Christians, when you stand up for your faith while under persecution, our Lord stands to his feet. Because the reality of stoning is this. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. I want you to catch this. The world hates when they are confronted with truth. It causes a problem with them. Have you ever been caught in a lie as a kid? You have the fight or flight syndrome. You want to run from the situation or you want to fight the situation. Nobody goes into this passive state. They go into a defensive state. They become angry. We become angry at people. That is our instinct as human beings. And these guys were confronted with the truth. They became angry. <coughs> and it says they rushed at him with one accord. It says, when they had driven him out of the city, you see, you couldn't stone him within the city limits and, and taint the streets. They had to take him outside of it. They drug this guy out and they bring him to his knees in front of him. They don't pick up little rocks like this and go, I hope you learned your lesson. They take a rock like this. And we see in history that they went on to stone him. And, and there in verse 58, when they had driven him out of the city, <clears throat> they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. This guy would become Paul later on. He was witnessing. He was the guy persecuting them. So they didn't toss a little rock at you while dressed. They took their coat off and laid it at the feet of Saul. They find a rock that is big enough to fit their hand and to stone somebody to death is to do this. The scripture says they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Yeah. 
Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. It's significant that the scripture says fell asleep. Because as a Christian, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's no fear in a Christian on when we leave this earth. So here is my question this morning, 2013, right where we are. What causes us to fear telling the truth to the lost people in this world? What stops us from being the witness we need to be? Is it embarrassment? Is it pride? Are we really, are we really afraid of what people are going to say about us because we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord? Jesus would be the one who would say, Whoever stands up for me in front of men, I will stand up for him in front of my Father in heaven. Not a lot of preachers preach the second verse when he says, But whoever denies me in front of men, I will deny him in front of my Father in heaven. Not because he's a mean God, but because he's a holy God and he can't have sin before him. He's telling us, I've done everything possible by giving you my son Jesus Christ as a living sacrifice. That if you would just believe in him and make him Lord of your life, you would be saved. Christianity church, listen to me right here. It's not a bunch of rules and regulations in how you dress. It is your personal relationship with Christ when you acknowledge and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is in fact the Son of God. And that I believe that He went to the cross on purpose, not guilty of anything, to die there in my place because I could not accomplish what was necessary to get to heaven. And the blood He shed there on the cross paid for my sins so that I could have that way. And that He was buried and raised again. And history tells us that for 40 days he walked around Jerusalem. And, and historians like Josephus and others wrote about this guy. And these guys are not Christians. They write in their annals of historical data. I don't know how to explain it, but this Jesus Christ, the one who was killed, the one that was buried, is alive. And I don't know what to tell you, except that we watched him go up into the heaven visibly with our own eyes. Now, the proof in the pudding there is that all of Jerusalem, those 460 synagogues that I was talking about earlier, who witnessed in Jerusalem what was going on, left those false teachings and followed the truth of Jesus Christ. They followed the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes unto the Father except through me. And we have historical data on top of our biblical truth stating that all of Jerusalem is converted and it spreads throughout the nation. These guys were mad and stoned Stephen to death because of what was happening and what their allegiance was. Their allegiance was the dollar. Their allegiance was their pride. Their allegiance was, you've got to be a part of this particular church to be somebody. I pray we never get to the place that we have to be first Baptist church and with our nose up in the air. Listen to me. We're just a church in Addis. We are believers of the one true God. And people will follow him because of what they see in you and I. So what are we afraid of? Why do we, why do we not tell the truth? Why do we quit when persecution happens? 
Why do we let Satan get a foothold in our lives? I think we struggle because our faith is more in what we do and what we can accomplish than what it is in Jesus Christ. I think we have real fears of letting go of what we know we can control and trusting in the God we cannot see. And Jesus would say when he ascended into heaven and all those people saw him and all those people converted, he would say, it is going to be tough for those who will by faith have to choose to follow me. But you will see a difference in their lives. What causes a billion people to follow a guy and to choose to die? We fast forward 250 years from Stephen. And a man stands with his wife and his children. And the Roman historian Tacticus writes the story out. In the very annals of history that we get our history books from LSU from, Berkeley, New York, and all the colleges in between. He writes in the historical annals that there stood thousands, yes, even tens of thousands of these Christians, and their allegiance I do not understand. For I witness today a man stand there with a Roman sword at his throat. And the Roman guard simply said, deny Jesus Christ, and you can walk away and live. And from the mouths of his children, the historian writes, the children said, Daddy, do not do it. The historian writes that day, the man died, and his wife died. And his children died at the mouths and the jaws of lions. For they refused to deny Jesus Christ. I can believe that we can be duped at times by people in this world. And I can give my allegiance to our mayor to our governor, to our president, but I cannot find it within me to let my wife and children die on their behalf. What they saw in Jerusalem in the first century so moved those people and nations that hundreds and thousands and millions of people have chosen to die rather than to deny Jesus Christ's reality. And the proof in the pudding in church is this. When you decide to follow Christ, real change occurs in your heart. You cannot love God and hate man. It is impossible and the God that created you, who is love, called us to this purpose to have a love relationship with himself. He says this this morning. I love you exactly the way you are. Words and all.